for joining us for this informative American Institute of Chemical Engineers webinar sponsored by Providence Consulting, Selected Pressure Relief Systems Heuristics. Our speaker is Justin Phillips. Justin Phillips has over six years of onshore and offshore oil and gas process engineering and project execution experience. His technical experience includes process design with specialty in flare and relief systems. Justin holds a BS in chemical engineering from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. He is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Texas. One quick note before I turn the session over to Justin Phillips. As described more fully on this slide, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers assumes no legal liability or responsibility for the use or misuse of the content in this webinar. And now I'd like to welcome Justin Phillips. Hi, Justin. Hi, Pam. Thank you. So on behalf of Provenance Consulting, uh, thank you to AICHE and thank you to Pam for helping us get this webinar put together and presented today. So before I start, I, I wanted to give a preface. This is a follow-up webinar to one that I delivered to AICHE back in January of this year. That was an introductory webinar meant to introduce basic concepts of overpressure protection systems. This webinar is a little bit more advanced, and we're going to talk about specific topics instead of generalities. Some of the topics that we discussed in the previous webinar were pressure relief systems. What are they? What do they look like? What are they for? some of the guidelines related to designing those systems and assessing those systems. We learned what protected systems were, we learned about overpressure identification, and we learned about quantification of relief rate. A little bit about the intended audience that I'm looking for today. So my real intended audience is for those of you out there that may have a little bit less experience than your peers or perhaps your process engineers that don't really deal with pressure relief systems on a very regular basis. You're my key audience. However, I do recognize that there's probably some of you out there that do work in pressure relieving systems all the time. I don't know whether or not you will learn as much from today's presentation as those of you who have less experience, but I think you may glean something from it. Um, the whole point of the presentation is to just share knowledge. I'm really hoping to enable some of you to feel more confident about the work you're doing with pressure relief systems. So an overview of today's topics, we're going to talk about heuristics. We're specifically going to talk about blocked pump outlets. We're going to talk about low pressure vent piping losses. We're going to talk about external fire. And then we're going to move on to some miscellaneous topics that came up during the last webinar. Those miscellaneous topics I wanted to talk about because they came up in several different questions and it was kind of a recurring theme. We're going to talk about the 3% rule and we're also going to talk about relief device maintenance. After that, we're going to have a Q&A session. So here's the basics. What is a heuristic? A heuristic is just an experience-based learning. A lot of people call heuristics rules of thumbs. They're these, these mental models that we all develop based on the things that we do and the outcomes that we see and the changes that we make in the way that we approach things. I'm taking a little bit of liberty with the definition of a heuristic. These are not just rules of thumb that I'm talking about. These are rules made of several thumbs. I mean, while there's a basic lesson to be learned from each of these things that I'm going to be talking about, it's important to me that you understand how and why to apply those lessons. And the how and the why of applying those lessons consists of several steps. You can ask yourself, what place do heuristics have in relief system design? So we have all of these codes and standards and recommended practices and all of these things are incomplete by nature. Nothing is perfect, and there is plenty of room for interpretation. Um, even OSHA PSM standard 29 CFR 1910-119 leaves plenty of room for interpretation. Um, and heuristics are important because they are what turn into codes and standards and recommended practice over time. And a lot of heuristics turn into what we recognize as RAGAGAP. RAGAGAP is a, an acronym for Recognized and Generally Acceptable or Generally Accepted Good Engineering Practices. So what should you expect from using heuristic? 
you should expect to get a safer and more cost-effective design in that order. Safety is paramount in relief system design. Being cost-effective is also very important. We want to avoid undersizing valves for obvious reasons, and we also want to avoid oversizing valves. The point of not undersizing a valve is because you want to have adequate relief capacity in case you have an overpressure. If you're undersized, you run the risk of running to a greater overpressure, having a loss of containment, having all sorts of bad stuff happen. We really don't want that to happen. Now, oversizing is, is not so clear. Some may say, well, if you've got a bigger PSV than you need, then you're definitely covered. That type of thinking is conservative, but it's really short-sighted. The fact is that not only do oversized valves cost more, their use can lead to instability in conventional applications. When they open up, they can release a lot more capacity than is needed, which can lead to instability. So it's, you can kind of think of it as an AC. So for those of you that have air conditioning in your house, you think, okay, you have some size AC, but sometimes it just takes too long to turn on. Maybe you want it to happen really fast. You can get a much bigger AC unit, air conditioning unit, and cool your house down much quicker, but if you oversize your air conditioning unit, you're gonna cool down your house instantly and the AC is gonna turn off. Its operation will become unstable because it has way more capacity than you need for your own need, than you need for your house. The first heuristic that we're gonna talk about is blocked pump outlet. So the best way to summarize this heuristic in just one sentence is do not neglect your line losses. I learned this one a little bit the hard way. So when I had learned how to do overpressure protection design for a blocked pump outlet, what I had learned was to ignore line losses. And those are the line losses between your pump, which is causing the overpressure, and your protected system, wherever the relief device is or wherever the relief device might need to be. So using that sort of basic approach, just get the flow from the pump and ignore anything in between sometimes yielded really ridiculous results, ridiculous relief rates, ridiculous PSV requirements. But working through those, those ridiculous results and kind of grinding, grinding on the problem some more and taking credit for those line losses yielded reasonable, agreeable results. And so that's what I'm going to talk about with this heuristic. Here I've got a fairly simple protected system. It's not the protected system yet. This encompasses a protected system and also kind of a surrounding process that's going on. So on the left-hand side, you see some sort of column. You have a liquid at the bottom of that column, which is flowing into a centrifugal pump. And then that centrifugal pump sends flow to two different heat exchangers, the shells of two heat exchangers. Um, through one of the heat exchangers, it, it doesn't go through a control valve. It just goes right on through the control valve and it doesn't go through a control valve, and for the heat exchanger on the bottom, flow and pressure is controlled by the control valve to control the amount of flow that goes through the lower heat exchanger. You could analyze this system and look for the potential for a blocked outlet, and I think it's, it's readily apparent. Let's say that this system is shut down for, for some reason. Say it's shut down for a turnaround or it's shut down for maintenance, what have you. So when things get turned back on, you're supposed to do things in a proper sequence where you open up valves before you start up pumps and that sort of thing. But let's just assume for a second that the pump, and I think I can use my arrow tool here to point to this valve on the right-hand side. Let's say that somebody forgot to open up that valve. Whoops, it's still closed. And let's say that they uh, also forgot to open up that valve and they started the pump. That creates a blocked outlet. So some system specifics, which we're going to use when we start to analyze the system a little bit more closely, is that we have here a liquid level height above the center line of the pump of 20 feet. We have a specific gravity of our fluid of 1. We just happen to know that our upstream maximum pressure is 5 pounds. We know that the MAWP, or maximum allowable working pressure, of the top exchanger is 50 PSIG, and of the lower is 30. So when we leave our system blocked in by leaving that block valve closed and this one closed, is that we have the pump that's been turned on accidentally without opening up those valves first, and now we have flow or pressure which can affect that shell side of that heat exchanger downstream. 
for this pump, we have its pump curve, and we know it's where it normally operates. In this case, let's say that it uses a 7-inch impeller, and it normally runs at 40 uh, feet of total dynamic head at a flow rate of 140 gallons per minute. There's 40 feet of head going all the way to the 7-inch pump curve. And then you come down from the pump curve, and you see that it normally runs at 140 gallons per minute. So the first step in release system analysis is to qualify whether or not you have an overpressure. So can we create a blocked outlet? Definitely. We just went through that. If you leave those blocked valves closed and you turn on that pump, you've got a blocked outlet. The next question is whether or not that blocked outlet can cause an overpressure. And in this case, we can exceed the MAWP. That causes an overpressure. Additionally, it does exceed the allowable accumulation above that MAWP. And I'll kind of show you why. If the maximum allowable working pressure is 30 PSIG, we have to see whether or not the pump can produce a pressure, if it is blocked in, that exceeds 30 PSIG, and then also if it exceeds uh, of the allowable accumulation. So the pump deadhead is 55 feet. If you were to go back to the pump curve and then follow the 7-inch impeller curve up to 0 gallons per minute, that's the deadhead. Well, that is the deadhead TDH, but you also have to take into consideration the maximum suction head. So we get the maximum suction head from the maximum upstream operating pressure plus the maximum liquid head that we saw inside of that column. In this case, we're assuming no line losses in between the, inlet, in between the bottom of that column and the inlet of the pump. And so once we take the maximum suction pressure and add it to the maximum discharge pressure at deadhead, we get the deadhead pressure which is 37.54 PSIG in this case. That definitely exceeds the MAWP, and it definitely exceeds allowable accumulation. So once we qualify the overpressure, the next thing we do is to find the required TDH. This is now getting into the real meat and potatoes of this heuristic. The required TDH, what is that? Required TDH is the term that I use to describe the differential head which corresponds to the relief pressure at zero pump flow at maximum suction head. It's a whole lot of words, but you'll see in a graphical example what I'm talking about. To put it another way, if you block in the system, this is the pump's TDH that we fix at the relief valve's fully open position. For the relief calculations, the required TDH corresponds to the MAWP plus accumulation. You can figure out what your required TDH is with this equation. We know that there's no elevation change between the pump discharge and the relief destination. At least that's how it is in our example. We're saying that from the pump discharge point all the way to where that, that imaginary relief device is going to be, it does not go up in elevation, nor does it go down. The relief pressure, if there was a relief device, we would probably set at the MAWP and allow it to go up to allowable accumulation. In this case, MAWP times 1.1 is 33 PSIG. So if we play around with the numbers real quick, we get a required TDH of 44.5 feet. So we found the required TDH. This is the point on the pump curve where most people would just find the required TDH draw that corresponds to the relief pressure, draw a line straight across, find its intersection with a 7-inch impeller, and then draw a line down and come to 120 gallons per minute and say, that's it, I'm done. The problem with this, though, is that we are completely remiss to stop here and choose that flow rate because we have not accounted for potential losses in the piping. This is especially true if you have a pump which goes to multiple destinations or if you have a more complex circuit. So the follow-up step is to determine the line resistance between that pump and between that relief destination. Line losses, pressure drop, force pumps to work harder and pu to push the fluid to its destination. So relief systems engineer can really use that to, to their advantage to take credit and potentially reduce the amount of required flow rate. So in our protected system, we have the pump Notice we have the control valve, 
then we've got the shell side of that exchanger that we need to that we need to protect. In our example, the control valve has a maximum CV of 20. Let's just say that that's what it is. So what this means is that the pump, if the pump was to be able to flow, its flow would be resisted by that control valve. Only so much flow can go through the control valve. And for simplicity, we're not going to assume any line losses. We're not going to look at this T. We're not going to look at any elbows. We're not going to look at the length of the pipe in between them, nor the diameter, nor the roughness. We're really just going to focus on that control valve. So Crane, just for background information, Crane Technical Paper 410 does provide background and formulae related to co flow coefficients for valves. It's a really handy reference. If you don't have a copy of this book, you should get one. So the simple relation of flow and pressure using CV is given by the following. You have flow rate in Q is equal to CV divided by the square root of your specific gravity and your pressure drop. And then you can rearrange that to get pressure drop as a function of your CV and your flow rate. So as I said, Q is flow, DT is pressure drop. A similar exercise can be done for any number of different pieces of equipment or instrumentation, and you can do it in the form of loss coefficients, K, or entirely as a pseudo CV. There is a way to convert between either one of those. So if we're going to build a relationship for line resistance in our particular system, we're going to do it based solely on the CV of that control valve. And so we know that if our flow rate can be a function of the CV of the control valve plus the pressure drop or and the pressure drop, then we can come up with a relation like this, where the flow rate Q is equal to the CV, 20, divided by the square root, of the specific gravity and the pressure drop. But we can also rearrange it. We can get pressure drop as a function of the flow rate and that CV. We can also convert this line resistance, this delta P, into the form of head loss, delta H. Since delta H is equal to, you can, you can, you can make it equivalent to the, the pressure drop times a constant divided by the specific gravity. So we can fill in the blanks. We can start plugging and chugging here. If we have our delta P right here, we can simply insert that into our delta H. So delta H is now a function of that delta P from earlier, which includes the CV and the flow rate. The next step is to determine the relief TDH. So as soon as somebody blocks that outlet, and turns on that pump, there is zero flow and therefore zero frictional loss in the line. However, the pump will increase on TDH. If, you're, if you can imagine the pump curve right now, that pump will increase on TDH, so your point will move up. You'll be at zero flow and your TDH will be at some number, but it will move up and it will want to start flowing. So as flow starts to occur, for instance, through the relief valve, the line, the line losses do as well. The pump TDH will increase to overcome any of those line losses, but it is limited by its pump curve. It's a physical limitation. The relief TDH will correspond to the TDH that is required to overcome those losses and deliver flow to the PSV. Again, we'll, we'll see this visually, and so I know there's a lot of words here, but you'll see it visually, and, and hopefully it'll make sense then. So as we continue trying to determine the relief TDH, once we refine that, find that relief TDH, we can find the relief rate that is associated with that point. And it really comes at the intersection of the pump curve for, in this case, our 7-inch impeller, and this line loss curve that we developed a few steps ago. So there's the line loss curve. The general form is, for, with respect to the relief TDH, is you take the required TDH and then you add on the, line, the, the head losses So our required TDH was 44 and a half feet. Now we add in the equation that we developed in order to determine head losses flowing through that control valve. So you can take the you can take this curve and plot it against your pump curve and look for the intersection. So I've highlighted the seven inch impeller curve. I've started my uh, TDH required at 44 and a half or so, and then I have just for each increment in flow rate, I've plugged that into my, re my relief TDH equation and gotten a different point on this graph. 
when I find the intersection between those two, I just draw a line all the way down, and I find a flow rate, which occur, which is the, the relief flow rate. So to recap, first thing you got to do is you got to qualify the overpressure scenario. The second thing you got to do is to determine the TDH at the maximum suction head that corresponds to the relief pressure. I call it required TDH. The third part is to determine the line losses between the pump and the protected equipment. You put these losses in terms of a head loss as a function of flow rate. Then you plot that on top of your pump curve, you find the intersection, and that will give you the associated relief rate. So really, what was the whole outcome of this? We took credit for the physical limitations in a protected system. We cut our required relief rate by 60%. So our first quick calculation, when we got to the end of step two, we found a relief rate of 120 gallons per minute. But closer inspection showed a relief rate of 45 gallons per minute. The problem with this is that the problem with, with blocked pump analysis in general is that a lot of people don't take the extra step. So a less sophisticated analysis would have arrived at 120 gallons per minute and sized the relief device according to that. However, by recognizing and taking credit for line losses, you can really afford a smaller relief device. Now in this example, 45 gallons per minute, 120 gallons per minute, that's tiddlywinks. It's nothing. It is a very, very small rate. And you could probably take care of that relief rate with the same size orifice. However, by applying this heuristic, this set of rules, and this way of approaching the problem, imagine if this was not 45 gallons per minute and 120 gallons per minute. What if this was 450 gallons per minute versus 1,200 gallons per minute? Then you're talking about real money. That's a lot of big capital investment if you're going to recommend a relief device to handle 1,200 gallons per minute if it only really needs to handle 450. Moving on to the next heuristic low pressure vent piping losses. So the best way to summarize this, just one sentence, is similar to the last one. Don't neglect line losses. I learned to consider vent losses partially out of curiosity and partially because of the tiny amount of verbiage in API 2000. We'll talk about that in a second. So how do you size a tank vent? I think a lot of people that are listening to this have probably have some sort of experience with this. It's really easy. I think you all know. So the first step is you read the API Standard 2000 to determine the venting requirements, be it in-breathing, out-breathing, fire, what have you. The next step is that you check the manufacturer's catalog and you choose a vent with a sufficient capacity for your relief requirements. As step three, you ask your boss for a raise because you are a genius and you got it done in no time, lickety split. However, Pressure drop calculations are often neglected during that vent sizing exercise. Why is that? And why is it important? So some of the things that I've heard in my experience, and some of you may have heard these as well, is pressure drop doesn't matter for those vents because the data sheet or the specification sheet doesn't even ask for pressure drop. It asks that for, uh, for PSVs that you put on vessels, but it doesn't ask that for tank vents, so it must not be important. Um, another excuse is the piping lengths are always really short for vents, and the diameters are really big. So if you have really short pipe lengths and really big diameters, the pressure drop is really low, and you can neglect it, right? The other thing is that API 2000, which is the document that we rely on with respect to low-pressure venting requirements, really doesn't talk about it. That's technically untrue because it does talk about it. I did a quick calculation, and I showed that less than 1% of API 2000, the verbiage is dedicated to the topic. And specifically, kind of cutting and pasting the sentences in which it's mentioned, API 2000 does say, inlet and out in the hydraulics can affect pressure relief device sizing. And that's pretty much it. It really doesn't talk about it. When I came across it for the first time to really start, it, I really wanted to take a look at this, I was reviewing an as-built system that was installed in the field. It was, a, it was a crude storage tank with a vent that was piped about 100 feet away. And so what I found that was that the vent had less capacity because of line losses that uh, were previously not considered. So somebody did the sizing for this vent based on, you know, the size of the tank and its venting requirements, and they, they chose a vent, but they didn't even consider the fact that they had tacked on 100 feet of 18-inch piping. They thought it would just be fine. 
that wasn't the case because pressure drop, even if you think it's going to be minimal, it can affect your vent capacity immensely. And this is no joke. So if you're thinking about vent set pressures and uh, for relief pressures or, or vacuum relief pressures, they are often in the decimals of PSIG and they're often measured in ounces per square inch. You can also measure them in uh, inches of water or millimeters of mercury, what have you. They are very low pressures. So pressure drop of just a few ounces per square inch can derate the capacity immensely. Where, do you, where would I find this to be most important? In any installation that has inlet or outlet piping to or from the vent. That would include block valves installed on the vent inlet and would also include perhaps piping uh, that comes off of the vent discharge on an offshore platform. A lot of platforms have oil storage tanks in the center of the platform or at some point on the platform and then they, they vent to the periphery of the platform. So really, how are you supposed to assess venting requirements with all, taking into consideration pressure drop? The first step is to de determine the regular venting requirement. So I'm just coming up with an example system, just an example system. Imagine you have an API 650 tank. It has a design pressure of one pound and a vacuum, a, a design vacuum negative half pound. Um, the roof is fixed and it's non-frangible. So the tank is uninstallated and it operates at ambient temperature and pressure with some range of fluctuation. It has some diameter and some height and it has some liquid level. And we know it's, it's wetted surface area. And we're going to say that it's full of hexane because why not? So if we read API 2000, we find that our venting requirement is 614,000 standard cubic feet per hour. Okay, step two. We know our venting requirement, so let's determine our vents capacity. So numerous vent manufacturers offer all kinds of venting and vacuum breaking technologies, and it could be really simple stuff like a gooseneck, which is just an open pipe which comes up and then vents down. Um, and you can have really complex stuff like pilot-operated pressure vacuum safety valves. There's a whole plethora of options. In our example, uh, our fire cases are controlling scenario, so we need to find, um, oh, and we also have an existing spring-operated vent that has the following characteristics. When you analyze this, it will totally depend on your application. Sometimes this is, you're doing a feed design and you really just need to figure out what type of vent needs to, how, what the capacity of your vent needs to be. And in some cases, this could be an as-built vent and you just need to check that it has adequate capacity. But the process is the same. In our case, the vent that we have installed has the following characteristics. Its set pressure is eight ounces per square inch. That's half of the design pressure for our tank. And it has a capacity based on the vendor catalog of 700,000 standard cubic feet per hour at 100% overpressure. In other words, if it's set at eight ounces per square inch and it gets to 100% overpressure up to 16 ounces per square inch, which is the design pressure of the tank, which we cannot exceed, then we have that capacity. So the next step, instead of just stopping there and saying, yep, we got that tank vent, 700,000 standard cubic feet per hour exceeds what we need, so we're fine. Stop and think about it. You've got to consider your piping losses. So let's assume that our vent flows its rate of capacity when it's open, 700,000 standard cubic feet per hour. This vent that we have installed, it doesn't have any inlet piping, so no sweat there. However, it has 80 feet of large bore outlet piping that's attached to it to carry vapors away from the area. This isn't common, but it can happen in some installations. So we run a pressure drop calculation, a simple hydraulic analysis using 700,000 standard cubic feet per hour of the vapor in question, and we find that we have three ounces per square inch of pressure drop. So now, instead of being 100% overpressure, we've actually got less than 100% overpressure. So instead of being 16 ounces over eight ounces, being 100%, well, giving 100% overpressure, we now have only 62.5% overpressure. So we run back to the vendor's catalog and it actually gives us a way to derate the capacity of the valve and it tells us, oh, it's 62 and a half percent overpressure. Your capacity is derated to 570,000 standard cubic feet per hour. So you've got to go back. Can you, you've got to confirm that vent capacity. 
570 is less than the 614 that we require, but you shouldn't panic yet because you need to iterate the delta P across that vent. So if we use the new capacity at this, at this first iteration, 570, we find that our outlet pressure drop is reduced to, instead of three ounces, two ounces. So you go back again and check your percent overpressure. So now we've gone up to 14 ounces per square inch, which means that our overpressure is 75%. So you go back to the vendor's catalog and check the capacity. Unfortunately, we look at the vendor's catalog and we find that the capacity is only going to get worse in between 570 and 600, which is less than the 614 that we require. You could iterate this all day long until you get to zero changes in your iterations. There is no hope. So let's recap the steps of this heuristic. Determine your venting requirements. Everybody knows that. Step two, determine your venting capacity for either a preliminary selection or for an existing device or for an existing device. Step three, and this is the step that I'm asking you all to take next time you assess one of these systems, determine the piping losses to and from the vent at an initial condition and then derate the vent capacity appropriately. Confirm that vent capacity by iterating. So what was the outcome of this specific example? We performed, performed diligence and vent sizing by checking the effect of piping losses on capacity because that's what API 2000 told us to do, even though it told us only in a few tiny places. We also determined that the installed vent's capacity is being restricted by its outlet piping. So in this case, we know that its venting requirements exceed its ability to vent, so we might recommend shortening or enlarging that outlet piping. Moving on, external fire. Uh, we're specifically talking about fire relief for vessels containing liquids and really about multi-component mixtures. If I could summarize this in just one sentence, I'd say consider the entire boiling range of multi-component mixtures. The purpose of this heuristic is to prevent undersizing due to limiting latent heat of vaporization and an arbitrary percent vaporization. Uh, this is a heuristic that I kind of learned over time, and I don't have a really particular example that pops into my head, but I have found that exploring the complete range of vaporization is technically satisfying. It is to me, at least, and it gives me greater faith in my results when I do an analysis of vaporization because of fire or whatever uh, over the entire range. However, there are some arguments for limiting the vaporization range. A lot of places limit it from 0 to 15 percent or 0 to 25 percent. They just say, go between those two points and that's it. You don't need to worry about anything else. What are the arguments for that? One of the big arguments is that if you have a fire that lasts long enough to cause that much percent vaporization, you've probably already left the facility, you're on a boat, you've run past the fence line, you're driving far, far away to get away from it because the entire facility is doomed. That may be the case. Another argument is that the boiling temperature, once you get to 100% vaporization, maybe the boiling temperature is so high that uh, the metal can't sustain it, that your, your strength of material will be so diminished that you'll, you'll have a loss of containment, in which case you can't even protect against that if it's a temperature-related issue. Some could say rigorous calculations take too long for the entire range of vaporization. If we're just going to do, do 0 to 25%, and not go all the way to 100, well, we're saving ourselves a lot of time and energy. And I, but I think the excuse that probably holds the most water is the highest relief rate occurs within that range. That is very usually the case, but it's not always the case. And that's why I just want you to all take off the blinders and think about this. So this is sort of a hand-drawn example of is just an example of a latent heat curve over vaporization. So let me just kind of explain the graph. In blue, in the blue curve, we have latent heat of vaporization given in BTUs per pound. It starts at about uh, 150 BTUs per pound at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and it slowly increases, and then it finds a local maxima, and then it decreases all the way to the end at about 50 BTUs per pound. In green, we have the temperature. So for multi-component mixtures, the temperature will change as different components are boiled off. So in this example, for this example fluid, the initial boiling point occurs somewhere around 110, but the final boiling point occurs around 275. And then 
on the bottom coordinate, we're just showing percent vaporization, uh, and we're, we're using volume instead of using mass. So we can see from the example graph that our latent heat from the beginning, let's go back to the beginning, starts at 150 and ends at 50. So we can see from the example that latent heat can drop to one-third uh, if you go to the very, very end of the boiling point. We also see that the temperature isn't that high. So earlier, one of the excuses that I've heard before is that your, your metal will fail because the temperature will be too high. That's not necessarily true. You can have your heaviest components can boil at a temperature that is relatively low and possibly within the design temperature range of your vessel. I also want to point out that there are certain company guidelines uh, that may give you boundary conditions, but be mute on certain subjects. So with external fire, if you're doing this sort of evaluation, be highly aware of the guidelines that you're given. For example, some company guidelines say to, may say to use the maximum wetted surface area to determine the heat input from fire. If you think about the heat input from fire calculation, it is a function of wetted surface area. So if, you, if, the, if a company guideline says use the maximum wetted surface area uh, and you always use that for all range of boiling, it makes it pretty easy because your Q is fixed. But the other thing I want you to consider is also transient effects. So as liquid boils away, the volume of the wetted surface area will decrease, and likewise, the heat input is also going to decrease. Um, so we know that from API 521, one way of determining heat input based on the wetted surface area uh, is to uh, use the wetted surface area as a, in a, with a function of some other things. But here, just the general uh, proportional kind of relationship is that Q is proportional to area to the 0.82. So over time, the vaporization rate may vary because your relief load is a function of your heat input divided by the latent heat. So if Q is changing over time and latent heat is changing over time, the relief rate would also change over time. So it might show uh, that the highest rate of vaporization really does occur at the beginning because you have so much wetted surface area. Um, however, it really depends on the fluid. And just a quick side note, so I'm using the word transient here. What I mean by transients is the state of the system at some specific time interval. The state of that system is not always the same, and it changes, so that's why I consider it transient. Uh, when you take a step back and you look at how the system changes over time, we're talking about dynamics. So just wanted to add that in. So if we look at how the system will change over time as things vaporize, this is the same graph as earlier. We have our latent heat, which starts around, I don't know, 150 BTUs per pound and then drops down to about 50 as it's completely boiled. However, if we take a look at the change in volume and wetted surface area of our particular system and we take a look at the relief rate, we can also graph the relief rate as a function of the change in wetted surface area and the change in latent heat. So if we were to, to, to put our blinders on and just evaluate the required relief rate from 0 to 25 percent, then by golly, we would find that the highest relief rate is right there at the very beginning. And we would see at 25 percent, oh, that's not that high. However, depending on the fluid and depending on how its latent heat changes as it's vaporized, if you take off those blinders and kind of follow this thing along its entire path, you could wind up with a relief rate that is higher at some point past your arbitrary percent vaporization or something that's equivalent or something that's, that would only confirm that, it just, that the relief rate gets lower and lower. So recap. One, for multi-component mixtures, consider the entire range of boiling and how composition, temperature, and latent heat change. Get a good feel for the physical properties of the fluid. And then also consider how that heat input changes over time. So the outcome of taking a closer look at how things vaporize is that you want to consider the entire range of boiling just to see how much latent heat can change. If you consider transient effects, you can take appropriate credit sometimes for the decrease in heat input. In some cases, this helps us from oversizing a valve. For instance, you could have low latent heat but low heat input from a fire. But in other cases, it can keep us from undersizing a valve. 
For instance, you could have a low latent heat that occurs just outside of your arbitrary range, but still has significant heat input. So that ends the heuristics portion of the webinar, and I'm moving on now to miscellaneous items which came up during the question and answer session from the last webinar. There was two that really came up a lot. Um, one was PSV inspection frequency, and the other one was the 3% rule. So these are not detailed, in-depth analyses of either of these topics. These are really just general to give more information uh, to you because of the base, based on the feedback from the last webinar. So let's talk about PSV in inspection frequency first. So it behooves any owner operator to ensure that their stuff works uh, and that it's inspected. And relief devices, just like a pump, just like a vessel, just like anything else in a facility, it behooves them to make sure that that stuff is going to work when it needs to work. The frequency of inspection is influenced by conditions that are set forth by code, law, standards, practices, but really the complete inspection policy is up to you, the owner operator. So how does law influence the frequency of inspection of relief devices? Just as an example, in Texas, Power boilers, which are constructed to ASME Section 1, are inspected once per year. So it might make sense for you to inspect them once per year. What do the practices and standards say that we have available to us? API 576, Inspection of Pressure Vessel Pressure Relieving Devices, and API 510, Pressure Vessel Inspection Code, really do provide some further guidance. Uh, what are some other things that could affect the frequency of inspection? Service and fluid. If you have something that is not volatile, not toxic, like water, if it's a PSD in, in water service, you probably don't need to inspect that as frequently as you would something that is in a toxic service. So the operating environment conditions, if you work in a very harsh or extreme uh, environment, it's probably very harsh and extreme on your equipment as well, and so the wear and tear may be greater. It may make sense to inspect equipment in those environments more frequently than those environments that are not so intense. It could also be based on the facility's experience. So the facility may know that certain units in certain places always have uh, trouble with maintenance or repair, or things always seem to corrode faster in those areas. A facility's experience may tell them to increase the frequency in certain places. It could also be based on manufacturer's recommendations for inspection frequency. And it can also be based on the failure rate of individual installations. So if you're, in, if you're uh, inspecting something every five years and then you inspect it one time and it fails, then you might increase the frequency that you inspect it on. Maybe instead of every five years, maybe you switch it to every three years until it gets back, until it shows that it that it's passes inspection, in which case you can bring it back up to five years. Moving on to the 3% rule. So just as kind of some background information, the 3% rule is essentially that inlet pressure drop to a relief valve shall not exceed 3% of set pressure. So what's the whole point of the rule? Decades ago, industry wanted to have some sort of common rule to prevent relief valve instability. And so while the nature of valve stability was not completely and totally understood, and I, wouldn't, I would say that it's not completely and totally understood now, a lot of people agreed that you could maybe guarantee some semblance of stability by limiting pressure drop. So what is the relationship between valve instability and the 3% rule? Not a whole lot. So user experience and theoretical work have both shown that valve instability is influenced by more than just an arbitrary line in the sand. So while it's true that you're, if your inlet losses approach the blowdown setting, you can have some sort of instability you can have stability with pressure drop, you can have instability at pressure drops less than 3%, which are nowhere near the blowdown setting. And also, you can get stable operation out of a relief valve if its inlet losses do exceed 3%. So as an analogy, let's say that you're driving down the road and the speed limit is 55 miles per hour. So you, thinking about yourself, does your experience tell you that you're gonna lose control if you go over the speed limit? or that you're going to guarantee your control of the vehicle if you're going less than the speed limit? Probably not. Are there other factors that may affect your ability to control the vehicle? Probably rain, for one. Are you more concerned about getting a ticket or losing control if you exceed the speed limit? And does obeying the speed limit guarantee that you will never get a ticket? 
So why should anybody follow this rule? OSHA considers it RAGAGAP for the purposes of the PSM standard. However, remember that RAGAGAP is open to interpretation. ASME Section 8 says it should be less than 3%. However, it says that in non-mandatory Appendix M. API 520 Part 2 says it should be less than 3%, but that's a recommended practice with a should statement. So is there any wiggle room? Yep, there sure is. A lot of owner-operators strictly enforce that 3% rule, but not everybody does. Exceeding the 3% is a matter of risk tolerance. It's a matter of internal and external ragged gap. It's a matter of engineering analysis, and it's also a matter of good lawyering. So currently, API 520 Part 2 says that pressure drop greater than 3% may be permitted if you have an engineering analysis but API 520 Part 2 doesn't really say what an engineering analysis entails. There's a coalition of participants from API, ACC, and the AFPM that have drafted and reviewed language to kind of describe what an engineering analysis entails. So ideally, it would include reviewing valve performance, relief history, uh, checking the valve for galling and how it looks, the condition of it when you're inspecting it, you could perform a force balance equation, or you could check the acoustic line length as well. But this verbiage that's been put together by this coalition has not been finalized. So some subtopics uh, that I just touched on with the engineering analysis are what is a force balance? So if you think of a seesaw, you've got overpressure and blowdown on one side, and you have inlet pressure drop and back pressure on the other side. If your overpressure and blowdown outweigh the inlet pressure drop and the back pressure, then your PSB is going to stay open. That's kind of a quick static check of whether or not you're going to be open. So as I said, you take your overpressure, your blowdown, your inlet drop, and your back pressure, and you compare the two. However, there's some caveats here. Blowdown is sometimes hard to nail down, but it, you can estimate it. The other thing is that the force balance, that, the way that I've shown it here in the seesaw picture, is static but the force balance across the PSV is dynamic. So bear in mind there are caveats associated with a, with a quick and dirty force balance. The other thing I mentioned was acoustic length. So acoustic length describes the distance between a relief valve inlet and the protected equipment. And it's given by this equation. L equals C times T divided by T, where C is the speed of sound, T is the opening time of the relief device, and L is the maximum acoustic length. So the way that this works is that imagine you have some sort of source of overpressure and you have a line connecting that source of overpressure to a release device. As the release device opens, a pressure wave travels backwards from the release device back to the, the pressure reservoir, and then a return wave comes back to keep the valve open. However, if that line is too long, the valve will open and close before that return wave comes back. That produces instability. So pressure waves travel at the speed of sound, which is really quick for liquids, but it's a lot slower, slower for vapors. So if you have a really, really long line and it's relieving vapor, then you might infer that you're going to have instability. And for two-phase fluids, it's really hard to nail down an acoustic length because the speed of sound will change in that fluid. If you have any sort of unstable flow regimes, slug flow or what have you, the speed of sound completely goes away unless you can guarantee some sort of homogeneity to your flow. So ex exceeding the acoustic line length may lead to instability, but it is not the sole contributor. Um, we're just are about, this is the end of the, of the webinar, so we're now into the, the Q&A session. One thing I wanted to mention, and I think uh, Pam may reiterate it, is that we only have so much time to talk today. However, what I really would like, if you have a question and it is not answered during today's session while we're doing the webinar, send the question anyway. Don't worry about it not being answered. I will review every single question after this webinar, and I will incorporate it into the very back end of this webinar so that when we produce the PDF, um, it will be in the back end. So if you've got a question and we don't get to it, don't worry. I'm going to try to get to it afterwards so that it's published with the webinar. Okay, thank you, Justin. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so let's start. For a pump which feeds a number of users, what is the appropriate assumption for the blocked outlet case and what condition for other users? 
So if we're thinking about the pump and the users, the users are really the protected system that we care about. So if you think back to the example that I gave in this webinar, we have these two users. It's really simple, but in, this, in, the, in, in my example, you have two users. You've got that one heat exchanger up on top, and then you've got the one heat exchanger on the bottom. For our protected, for our protected system analysis, we really focused on that one on the bottom. Likewise, if you have multiple users coming from uh, some pump, you just have to uh, analyze that one user, each user at a time for that pump because the hydraulics are going to be totally different for each of those users because if it branches out to multiple users, the hydraulics are totally different. So you've got to develop those line loss curves on a system-specific basis for each of those users. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you. Here's a question we got early in the webinar. For the blocked pump outlet, at what point would you consider an upstream pressure at a pressure other than normal operating? Why not use MAWP? That's a good question, and I'm glad that they, they mentioned using MAWP as an, upstream, as, an, as an upward limit of the maximum upstream operating pressure. So whenever you're doing blocked pump outlet analysis, you really should look at the maximum, whatever it is, the maximum upstream pressure. Sometimes that pressure can be limited by a pressure switch setting. Sometimes it can be limited by a PSV. Sometimes it's limited only by liquid head if it's coming from an atmospheric reservoir. However, I want to... I want to drive this home, you cannot and should not use MAWP of an upstream system as a limiting factor for your maximum upstream pressure because an MAWP is just a number. An MAWP is not going to stop a pressure from getting any higher or any lower. An MAWP is just a pressure rating on a vessel, has nothing to do directly with what that maximum upstream pressure can be. We design relief devices and we set our pressure switch settings such that we try to avoid getting up to MAWPs on the upstream side. But again, do not use an upstream MAWP as the maximum suction pressure. Okay, thank you. Is the 10% rule on PSV outlet pressure drop also related to instability chattering? So the 10%, so we say the 10% rule. So to give a little bit more background, the 10% rule, this rule only applies to conventional relief devices that are unbalanced. So the 10% rule is actually, it, there's a little bit more to it because it can actually go up to 21% if you have a fire. That back pressure, we'll call it the back pressure rule instead. The back pressure rule for conventional installation says that your back pressure shall not exceed your allowable overpressure. So if you have, a, if you have an MAWP of 100 and your allowable accumulation is 10%, then the back pressure limitation for your relief device, if it's relieving to protect it, is also 10%. If you exceed the back pressure for that conventional device, uh, if you go above 10%, then you will certainly have instability. It will not stay open because the force balance across the valve will cause the valve to reseat. So yes, it will lead to instability if you exceed that back pressure limitation. However, there are balanced bellows valves, for instance, which can go up to a much higher back pressure because they are balanced to prevent that, that force balance from overpowering the valve and making it reseat during an overpressure. Okay, thank you. For the transient fire, do you ignore components that are dissolved in PPM concentration, such as H2S or other components in small concentration? These components will affect the relief temperature and the heat capacity and make the relief size not practical? I guess it really depends on the specific mixture that you have. However, uh, using, and I wouldn't do this by hand, but if you use, say, a commercial simulator, you can look at both cases. You can do one case where you have dissolved uh, gases like H2S or what have you, and then try another case where you get rid of those gases to compare the results. Okay, thank you. How do you really, estimate fleet? I'm sorry, were you finished? Well, I was going to say it, it really comes down to a judgment call. Okay, thanks. How do you estimate relief device size and load for a positive displacement pump? That is super easy. Positive displacement pumps have typically a fixed volume that they displace and pump. You would use it for that fixed volume. However, I would say you've got to be a little bit careful because you have different types of uh, positive displacement devices. Um, they can be, they can use uh, 
rods and pistons, or they can use lobes, or they can use what have you. And so if you look at kind of the, the instantaneous flow rate over a very short time, you have peaks and valleys in the flow. And usually PV pumps are installed with some sort of bladder to stabilize uh, that, that rise and dip in flow rate so that its average flow rate is given. Regardless, you can get the rated flow rate for the PD pump based on its, uh, its specification sheet. And that's usually a safe way to size a PSV for it. Thank you. What are some of the worst case scenarios with system instability, such as with a long acoustic lens? So let's assume, so from this question, let's assume that the long acoustic length was longer than, you know, the maximum allowed for whatever this system is. Um, so if you've got severe instability, you can have, uh, you can have vibration effects. So the acoustic length itself just means the valve is opening and closing before a return pressure wave occurs. But those long line lengths can also lead to, they can be mechanically unstable. They're, they could be subject to vortex load shedding. They can start to shake. In a worst case scenario, you would have a relief event where your piping is shaking so violently that it shakes apart uh, bolts that are holding things in place. It shakes apart um, tie downs in your pipe rack. It can cause rupture in the pipe. It can cause mechanical failure of a protected system, mechanical failure of the relief device. All types of bad stuff can happen. Long, those long inlet line links uh, should really be, it should really have a, a closer look if you do have them installed because they can, they can lead to some bad stuff. How do you estimate PSV blowdown? So blowdown settings are best given, get best taken from uh, relief device manufacturers. If you can get a certified amount for that blowdown or if you can uh, pop open the valve and check its blowdown setting, that's probably the best way. Um, otherwise, I would, I would lean on the manufacturers and the manufacturer's engineering uh, data to get an estimate for the blowdown if you don't already have it. Okay. Uh, is it correct that calculations for thermal expansion relief PSVs on exchangers are not required by law in the U.S.? I understand that it is enough to install a three-quarter inch PSV on the TWR line of an exchanger set to relieve a nominal flow rate of, say, 5 GPM. So the first part of that question, is it required by law to not have a PSV installed for thermal relief? Um, let me get back. Is it correct that calculations for thermal expansion relief PSVs on exchangers are not required by law? Yes. So if you can use, I guess this is an ASME Section 8 application, if you can get away with using UG140, overpressure protection system by design, uh, then the answer is probably yes. By law, you can probably get away without installing a PSV on that system. For instance, um, I can't think of a super good example, but it's possible. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's go for one more question. Is a PSV appropriate for protection against overpressure from a tube rupture in an exchanger with high pressure gas on the tube side and water on the shell side? So the current way of thinking, I think the general way of thinking in industry right now is that some PSVs will not open fast enough to uh, protect against that very transient pressure, pressure surge, which occurs uh, when you have sort of a tube rupture with high pressure gas on, on one side and, uh, and an incompressible fluid on the other. Um, however, that's not necessarily the case. So it has been shown that PSVs uh, may open quickly enough to respond to that transient pressure surge and protect against the overpressure. Um, but also, I think a lot of times, uh, rupture discs are also installed because they do they are they open uh, just as fast or faster than the than the PSVs do. However, there is something to be said for that transient pressure surge. You could have a huge spike in the pressure inside of your system during the tube rupture, um, which may not cause kind of a, a mechanical system failure, but it may certainly deform your system and still cause leaks, regardless of whether or not your PSV or your rupture disc can handle the required relief rate. Okay, thanks for that answer. Sorry, but that's all the time we have for questions. So as, Jun as Justin mentioned, if your question was not answered, please send it to producer at AICHE.org.
And so now on behalf of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and everyone who attended today, I'd like to thank Justin Phillips for this very informative webinar. Thanks also to our attendees for your participation and thoughtful questions. Please visit AICHE.org to replay this webinar or to view and sign up for our many others. Goodbye, and we hope to see you again in a webinar soon.